So welcome everybody to the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association Wednesday webinar series. This is our second of the crop by crop speed shares where each farmer is gonna speak for somewhere between five and 10 minutes about their favorite crop to grow or least favorite depending. And we'll have a few minutes for questions after that, but we're gonna keep things uh, chugging along. So feel free to pop questions in the chat. And at the end, we might have a few minutes for discussion. We're starting today with Andy Jones from the Intervale Community Farm talking about Brussels sprouts, followed by Patrick Sullivan from Ananda Gardens talking about brassicas more generally, Seth Bent from Mink Meadow Farm potatoes, and delicata squash with Jake Hornfeld from VYCC and the farm upstream. And finally, wrapping it up with garlic by Rachel from the Catamount Farm Farmer Training Program. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Andy. Zoom protocols, as everybody knows, just try to stay muted and pop your questions in the chat. And thank you everybody so much for sharing and joining today. All right, thanks Becky. I'm gonna try to whip through this and stay on my time contract. I'm Andy Jones for Intervale Community Farm in Burlington. Um, quick little stats. Um, we do about 22 acres of field veg, half an acre of tunnels. Um, have about a third of an acre of Brussels sprouts. You know, that's like 2,400 plants. Um, harvest typically 75 to 80 percent of that um, is harvestable by the time we we get out there for various reasons quality or otherwise um, we only do 90 percent of our business is CSA and we only do Brussels sprouts for our winter CSA share so um, so what we're looking for is like 300 units every couple of weeks um, 150 units a week um, is all we really have to achieve. Um, and because of that, we can also be a little bit less particular. And so I think that's an important thing to consider in terms of how we approach growing them. We do all whole stock harvest. Um, we don't have to truck those anywhere because people come to us. All of our distribution happens at the farm. So, um, so it makes things a little bit easier, I think, in terms of our production practices. Um, they are, um, in in that said, um, a pretty solid chunk of our winter CSA share value when you look at the last few years when we've had decent Brussels sprouts, it's like 10, between 10 and 15% of our overall share value, which is, you know, all the other things you would expect, carrots, potatoes, um, cabbage, winter squash, spinach, lettuce, all that kind of junk. Um, Brussels sprouts are a substantial thing and they're really popular. Um, so um, they are, we do a survey every year of our CSA members and Brussels sprouts are right up there. Um, you know, they're after carrots and they're after spinach, but um, they're still a pretty popular crop uh, with our CSA members. So um, planting, um, <clears throat> we set things out pretty wide, uh, 24 by 36 inch spacing. Our beds, typical bed spacing is 72 inches on center. Um, so we're giving them lots of air circulation so that we get better uh, disease control, um, try, trying to keep those leaves dry uh, and better spray penetration for the spraying that we do. Um, we use a water wheel transplanter with a light fish seaweed blend. And we wait um, fairly late, I think, for a lot of people um, in terms of when we plant the crop. So um, we're looking at like the second week or so of June, somewhere between the 10th and the 15th is pretty typical. Um, and that allows us to really get the bulk of our fertility out of a uh, really good cover crop. So we're aiming, typically we try to, uh, we try to precede our Brussels sprouts with a full mature rye vetch crop with a good portion of rye. Um, brassicas are pretty effective nutrient foragers. So um, as a result, they, they can usually get by without uh, a whole lot of additional fertility. We're on sandy soil, so we almost always end up adding potassium. Um, but we can often get away without much, if any, supplemental N. Um, because we're planting somewhat later uh, in that in that early June uh, or early to mid-June window, 
Um, we can't really grow the longest season Brussels sprouts. There's some great ones out there. Um, and uh, in the 120, like Nautic is a really nice organic one that has really nicely spaced sprouts, which is great for disease, but it just didn't quite mature the sprouts enough for us um, in order to allow us to do that delayed planting, which has other benefits. Um, so once the plants are in the ground, uh, our weed control is pretty standard. Um, we do get a little bit of alleliopathy from the rye breaking down most years um, to suppress some of the early weeds. Brassicas are pretty competitive. Um, they can also handle a lot of knocking around. So we do usually a few rounds of uh, uh, with a flex tine, uh, some blind cultivation, try to get as much of the in-row stuff as possible. And usually that's about three times before they start to, before we start to tear leaves or we start to need to be a little bit more aggressive. Usually at that point, we can switch over to finger weeders. Um, so we have a couple of finger weeders set up on a Farmall Super C, which has good clearance. Uh, and we do those until they're probably about this size. Um, once we're done with that, uh, we'll shift over to basically a, it's a two row cultivator. So we've got three wide 22 inch shovels um, that we run off of the toolbar and they can kind of, they're wide enough that with a little bit of speed, they can reach under um, the canopy as it's getting wider and we can still um, get rid of some of those weeds that are sort of growing under the drip line of the plants. Um, yeah. And we hoe and hand weed as necessary, but typically it would be once, maybe a second time for a cleanup later on. Irrigation is critical for us being on sand and in sort of the hot Champlain Valley, the banana belt. Um, we learned over the years that we really need the sprinklers for good establishment. And it also makes the cultivation much easier because we don't have drip lines that we're worried about snagging, but we have, um, maybe five years ago, we started to switch over to drip partway through. And you can see um, on the right-hand photo, although it's actually the kale, the Brussels sprouts are over here to the right. You can see the drip line um, sort of along the edge of the canopy. So we'll have the sprinklers in there for um, several weeks. You can actually see this is sort of the end of the sprinkler uh, there. And then we roll out drip lines and you can use that um, two row cultivator to actually sort of, if we lay the drips in the middle of the bed, oops, um, we lay the drip in the middle of the bed, running through quickly with the cultivator will kind of nudge those lines in under the canopy uh, and save us time in the placement of it. Um, but we try to keep them, try to have the Brussels sprouts have good moisture for the whole season since they like it cooler and wetter. We do a little bit of plant maintenance um, as a once over the end of August to Labor Day, somewhere in that range, we go through and we top all the plants um, and uh, strip off a bunch of the lower leaves. Typically we'll leave maybe 12 or so leaves at the top of the plant. Um, they'll continue to grow some, uh, but it promotes air circulation, keep those bottom, um, bottom sprouts a little bit drier reduce the amount of funk. You can certainly still see some um, over there, but um, mostly the sprouts will be fairly clean still at harvest if, if it's a not a crazy wet season. Um, and it does help with some uh, uniformity. I will say that the varieties are, there's a genetic component to that. So if you're topping your Brussels sprouts to try to get them to fill out the stock, um, you want to make sure you've got a variety that wants to be topped because there are some that sort of self terminate um, and you may not want to top those even if you want a uniform stock. Um, insect and disease management are always a bit of a challenge. Um, Swede midge has been our, up until the last few years, has been a real problem for our Brussels sprouts. All of that is really um, rotation. So um, getting as far away as possible from last year's crop. And there's not a whole lot more that you could do. Uh, 500 feet can help if you've got hedgerows also according to Cornell. So we try to separate our spring and our fall brassicas and try to separate them from where they were last year. 
cabbage aphids, we've been spraying more and it's a little tricky to spray Brussels sprouts. So we try to use higher pressure. We go through, I was spraying every 10 to 14 days, various different materials, um, trying to think about what did I want to leave on the surface that everybody would be eating. So we shade, shied away from some things that were a little more persistent, but the truth is we just don't really know what works that well. And the cabbage aphid population seemed to go up and down so much that I don't know if what we're doing is what's good or if we're really making a difference with all of our sprays. If Since we're doing more spraying, we may well just um, start to do some disease sprays in with our uh, insect sprays as well. Uh, microbials mostly, we've had good luck in onions with some of those kinds of things, Bacillus subtilis, Serenade and others. Harvest, um, like I was saying, we do a full stock harvest. Uh, they go into the bulk bins. Uh, you can see one here on the wagon. And um, we get 80 to 100 stocks per bin. Uh, we harvest a few straight out of the field for CSA, but then we do all of them before it gets too cold out, usually nights under about 20 degrees. Um, or if we're going to have days where it's below freezing for a couple days in a row. So for us, usually that's around the week of Thanksgiving, maybe a little before, maybe after that. And then we can keep those in the cooler through December uh, for our CSA. Um, so finishing up economics, um, you know, we did slightly better than average last year, I think because of the drier fall um, with, you know, harvesting 2000 stems at a pound and a half to two pounds per stem. We're looking at three to 4,000 pounds of sprouts. Typical organic sprouts seem to be six to nine bucks a pound. We're we count ours at six because we still have some weird ones on the bottom. We're not topping them. I mean, we're not stripping them. Um, but still, we're looking at, you know, potentially the acre, an acre is like a pretty good gross per acre. Um, you know, I haven't, Brussels sprouts are a small enough crop for us that I haven't actually looked at the, and we know we're going to do them for our CSA. So I haven't uh, really done a fine tooth comb on our production expenses, but our sort of running farm average of all of our crops is about 30,000 an acre when you include overhead and land rent and blah, 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 blah. So it works out on that. But I will say the Brussels sprouts are maybe the most variable of all of our crops, um, if not the most, then nearly the most. So we had no Brussels sprouts in 2021. We lost them all to cabbage aphids. All right, I'm done. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah. It's a perfect nutshell of Brussels sprouts. Definitely uh, my favorite crop to harvest. <laughs> we stopped the machete though. Sorry, Becky. <laughs> I have I have a question. How um what exactly is that funk on the bottom? And how do you guys deal with it? Because it's so time consuming peeling layers off, we've found. Yeah, we are not peeling layers because we're leaving them on the stock. So what we'll do is at harvest, we'll either harvest above the worst of them um, or we'll cut them off and then snap off some of those before we stick them in the bins. Um, and then our CSA members are on the hook for peeling them at home. So it's mostly alternaria. Um, there can be some some other stuff in there, I think, after the alternaria takes hold, but that's that's primarily what it is. Great, Andy, if you can, um, I'm going to let Patrick go, but can you pop your sprayer pressure in the chat? Thanks. Over to you, Patrick. Sure. Thank um, you so much, Andy. All right, so we're in on the gardens. We're in Montpelier, just uh, north of Montpelier. Um, we do 150 CSA in the summer and more like 100 in the spring and fall, um, about nine months of CSA a year. Uh, run the farm with my family, two daughters and my wife. Um, I do all the production. She does all the marketing. And then we have seasonally um, about four full-time equivalents, um, more or less. Um, let's see here, this is just like a 13 second drone shot so you could see the farm. Um, right next to a reservoir. So we're growing um, really intensively on about an acre and a half uh, and then have, um, yeah, something like 20,000 square feet 
um, 15 to 20,000 square feet of greenhouses. And we um, have really boosted the soil organic matter on the one and a half acres that we grow on and focus on that. Um, and yeah, try and do like high density, high yielding crops. Let's see if I can, okay, here we go. Um, for our CSA, we grow broccoli, the brassicas, we grow broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Chinese cabbage, Brussels, kale, collard greens, bok choy, salad turnips, and kohlrabi. Uh, and then for, C for the CSA and wholesale, we grow brassica, salad greens, and some baby bok choy. But we're pretty much just growing these for our CSA. Um, yeah, we found like broccoli is such a popular crop. Um, and I picked the brassicas because it can also as a family, mostly the broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels, the other brassicas we find are like really easy to grow in our system. Uh, but the broccoli, cauliflower and Brussels are one of the more challenging crops, one of the more variable crops for us. So I wanted to, yeah, present about that. Um, also hear feedback and Andy definitely answered some questions about Brussels. Uh, those three I mentioned, we kind of plant it and leave it with really all of them, plant it and leave it. They're not as much attention. Uh, that strategy seems to work really well in the spring and summer, but not as well for our fall crops. So we're the Brussels in particular, um, we don't, we have not had strong harvests, but all the brassicas we grow in the kind of early summer to late summer always seem to do great. Uh, but then our fall crops struggle a little more. Uh, we need it for our CSA, uh, as I mentioned, the broccoli, just like especially so um, in our surveys, people always like, like as much broccoli as they can get. Uh, but we don't really consider it a lucrative crop, so we don't try and grow up for wholesale. We've noticed that some farms on our scale like leave them out other than the shorter harvest window ones, or excuse me, the, the shorter days to maturity ones. They kind of just leave out broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels from the CSA. Um, but we like growing them. We, yeah, we think they're important. So what's worked really well is we do two early spring rounds. We seed in late March and then again in mid-April. Uh, and then we seed the Napa a little earlier than that just to get something to our CSA like the first summer, the week, the first, last week of spring, first week of summer, we already have Napa. We can stretch the harvest out with different varieties. So we generally plant a couple varieties of each with different days to maturity. Uh, we're planting pretty close, one foot apart in row and two feet apart between the rows. Um, so it's basically two rows a bed in our system. And we fertilize with, um, we've been fertilizing the last couple of years with 150 pounds of peanut meal, 25 pounds of Pro Booster per 10 beds or 4,000 square feet. Uh, we've also been mulching uh, with straw and wood chips in the past, straw in the beds. Um, and then they basically get planted and covered in the spring. That's just with row cover. Um, so this is what it would look like. Uh, that's a spring crop on the right hand side and left is, yeah, us planting Napa cabbage. Um, so for fall crops, um, we're seeding kind of as I did research about planting dates. Um, it seems like the traditional planting dates, seeding dates were like mid May for a fall crop. And we've just found that they, um, we, we seed then, but we've been able to push it almost another month because those early ones just seem to um, mature so early. Uh, yeah, before we really want them. Um, we're planting, we're seeding cabbage mid June to store. Um, and we are planting that round generally last couple of years into a killed winter rye mulch grown in place. We found it harder to kill the winter rye than some farms. We need to tarp it for like two weeks at least uh, to really make sure it's dead and yeah, not still alive and gonna grow once we plant. And then that round we're covering with exclude netting the 85 grams, um, the stuff that was just advertised the other day, last couple of days on the, on the listserv. Uh, that has worked fantastic for a Swede mid, um, and yeah, we really like it. It's held up super well for us so far. Um, we're generally planting the fall crop on like the periphery of our farm because we're like maxed out and stretched for space. So um, 
that could be why we've had some more issues with it. It just, they don't get walked by as much. They don't get as much attention as some of the other crops. So the successes have been that the, yeah, our cabbage seems to just always do awesome. Um, it still looks great right now. Uh, and yeah, we just kind of want to grow more and more of that to be able to hold it all, all winter and give it in our spring CSA. Bok choy, kohlrabi, and the turnips are always super reliable, easy to grow. Um, but over those, bok choy seems, or excuse me, broccoli is like always the most popular and just a little harder for us to grow in the fall crop. And Napa is great. Every time we grow it, we seem to get a, uh, an awesome harvest. Uh, we just need to keep it covered. And that we are usually keeping covered with, um, with row cover whenever we grow it. We don't switch to the exclude netting. Uh, the issues, um, yeah, as I mentioned, the winter rye. Um, it's interesting, like everywhere we plant, we don't irrigate on our farm other than when we are um, setting transplants out or direct seeding. And the soil like handles that fine on our farm, except through that winter rye. Theoretically, like we should have a ton of moisture underneath that mulch, but for whatever reason, planting in the summer, um, that under that winter rye, like could be right next to it, just beds that have been composted and have a mulch on it seem to hold soil moisture a lot more. So uh, we always just have to go back and kind of replace some transplants. We've had serious gopher damage under the exclude netting. Uh, we like take up the exclude netting and just find um, like, like in this case, a lot of these plants were just gnawed off and then like re-sprouted and beginning to grow. So a couple years ago, we had almost no fall broccoli and cauliflower because of that. Um, so we found that, yeah, just constantly, also because we are kind of planting it on the edge, they live in the edge of the forest um, and come in. Uh, we've just been trying to trap, um, have a heart traps like all summer long set. Uh, the, yeah, as I mentioned, late May seeding maturing too early, late June seeding a little more mature, a little more erratic in maturing. Those are the broccoli and cauliflower. We're going to see that one week earlier this season. So I think like kind of mid to earlier June for our last round of broccoli. Um, and the Brussels sprouts are never as big and clean as we hope. I think uh, for after Andy's talk, we may just be planting them too close together. We do 18 inches between plants and the same thing, two rows per bed. Um, and then the salad greens, brassica salad greens um, are really pretty straightforward for us. We're fertilizing with like a third to a quarter of the rate that we fertilize uh, the other brassica crops with. Uh, we plant weekly outdoors as soon as its soil is snow free. Uh, in the summer, we've been switching to insect netting. The 85 gram exclude netting has not worked for us. Um, flea beetles just seem to get right through that stuff. Uh, so we've switched to the really fine. It's almost like a stocking. You get you only get a couple years out of it before it gets holy and it's expensive. Um, but that really, really works. Um, and yeah, I would say generally consistent, really per supply, except for July and August, that the greens can get a little too stemmy. Um, and not sure whether we need to reduce our seeding rate or we're going to just start seeding more time, like two times a week, uh, and then just passing over some rounds when they don't look perfect. Um, yeah. So that is most of what I have. Um, if anyone has any questions, we could open it up to some questions. Um, Patrick, there's a question from Lisa in the chat about varieties for mini broccoli. Maybe you could sure. type. Oh yeah, I didn't talk about the mini broccoli. Um, this last year we trialed mini, mini broccoli and it was awesome. Uh, we get two, at least two cuts out of it. We, I think we even got three cuts in the fall. Uh, you make just like a nice big bunch. It seems so much more flexible and easier to grow than uh, just the big head broccoli. Um, and you can also use the entire stem in the just single head broccoli. Yeah, I find the stem just to be like so pithy and big. Um, so our customers actually really like wanted the stems on the mini broccoli. We grew the variety from Johnny's called BC and then a bunch of numbers. 
um, 117, something like that. Uh, and that is the only one we've grown. Uh, and I think we're just gonna, yeah, just keep growing more of that. Um, we, we really, really liked it. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I'm going to keep us moving along. If people have more questions for Patrick, you can pop them in the chat or maybe we'll have time at the end. There you go, Seth. Are you, are you good to go? Awesome. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So just What's tell that, me when you um, want me to move it along. Oh, thanks. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, my name's Seth Bent and we're at Mink Meadow Farm in Etna, New Hampshire down by Lebanon, uh, across the river from White River Junction in the Upper Valley. And we have about five acres or so that we cultivate, um, one of which um, is mainly for potato or is for potatoes. And it's essentially all wholesale. We have a farm stand by the road and the rest of the potatoes go up to um, Route 5 to Danielle and Ben. Um, They'll buy any potato. They're sick of growing them, so they'll buy any potato we can ship up to them. <laughs> but we usually plant them into a block that had uh, winter rye the year before, and our equipment's kind of limited. So we'll just mow that down, just use discs, the six, seven foot discs um, once or twice, and um, try and get it pretty level. And to start the beds, I just have a seven shank kind of chisel plow so i'll take the hooks off keep one center in between the tractor which is a massey ferguson 1440 so it's about i don't know 48 inch wide beds or so um so i'll just strike a line maybe an inch or so deep and just drive up and down to mark the beds and we just drop the seed potatoes um just right in that groove. Um, we get our seed potatoes from Chappelle, so over in Williamstown, which we found are by far the best quality um, and they're great. Uh, so we grow about usually three to five varieties, something like that. Um, just try to keep everybody happy. Um, and we just plop the whole seed potato down. We don't cut them, we don't chit them or greens. We've tried green sprouting in the past, but um, honestly, we don't really have enough data recorded to kind of, we found that with our time uh, constraints, we just drop them right in the ground and then cover them up. It's just uh, my sweetheart, Sarah, and I and our, our uh, folks help us out and a couple of neighbors, but we don't have any employees. So we're kind of busy. Um, <laughs> And then to cover them, I'll just, uh, we cut out this slab of oak and put two discs to hill the potatoes. I think maybe, but yeah. I don't know if that's a video or not, but, um, and just drive along, straddle the, <laughs> the line of uh, potatoes and usually shoot. So when the potatoes are sitting in that little groove that I've struck, it, it keeps them from tumbling side to side. And we, this last year we did um, amend the beds a little bit. I can't remember what the ratios were, but uh, we didn't find a huge uh, difference. Um, we do not irrigate them. We're not set up to, I guess we could, but um, if it's wet in the middle of the summer, we grow mid-season potatoes around 90 days. We found that uh, if it rains, it helps big time. Um, so I'll just dry the bed and hill them and uh, they kind of come up four to six inches of soil above the potatoes and just kind of let them sit. Then when they come up a little bit more, we'll hill them more. I kind of tend on making wider hills rather than taller because we don't have cultivating tractors. We don't have any super seas or anything that um, can really clear the plants once they once they grow up larger. I'll just cultivate the wheel tracks with uh, put the hooks back on the chisel plow and just kind of hit that's a picture of the hiller super simple super basic those channels in the oak allow me to uh, widen or narrow the hills and then there are three settings on each disc rather than to um, grab more or less soil uh, to bring over the potatoes. 
So I'll do it about two or four times. It's also a form of weed control for us. We don't have any time weeder uh, to weed the hills or anything like that. Um, and it keeps the bugs at bay. Uh, the Colorado potato beetles, um, they can really hammer us pretty hard. Last year, we had big success with planting a, um, a trap crop early, which were just old beat up potatoes that were in the walk-in over winter. And then in three different successions, a week apart. So they came up, bugs went straight to them. Um, and then I just torch them. Don't really care about the potatoes. They're pretty tiny anyway. So just burn those bugs down and rotating. We have a brook that goes to Mink Brook, runs right through the farm. So we'll rotate across the brook each year in uh, two or three different blocks. Um, so that, yeah, trap crop worked pretty well that we will get out and spot spray. Um, we've used in trust, um, had a hell of a lot of success with Trident, um, but I don't think that's uh, organic anymore. So um, that's probably, you know, so we don't use that anymore. Um, and Another problem is the leaf hoppers because we make a lot of hay. We have cows and do square bales. So we will leave a 10 foot or wider strip of uh, Timothy and clover around the block to keep the, the hoppers kind of in that strip. We, we, one year we mowed right up to the potatoes and the, the hoppers just burned them down um, pretty quick, which is amazing. But um, and then prior to harvest, I mean, they usually go down anyway with some sort of late blight, the potatoes, um, but I'll mow them regardless if the plants are dead or not. I just mow them right down to whatever, a couple inches above where the stem comes out, the stalks up. And that allows the skins to harden, um, which is crucial for us with our harvesting technique. Um, we have this, 40s McCormick, um, it's a rod link elevator style um, digger that runs behind the tractor and it's was PTO, now it's hydraulic run. Um, but it, it's wicked, it's all cast iron, thing flies apart all the time, so we're <laughs> fixing it a lot. But um, the potatoes get super uh, thrashed if we don't let the skins harden up. Um, and it's about six to eight feet long or so, that digger. So we just set it so it kind of cuts right where the seed potato is and grabs all the hill and tumbles the potatoes. And ideally, you know, that bed right there, look, I wish it looked like that every time. That looks pretty nice. <laughs> um, and then we just walk, walk by and pick them up in little bulb crates and essentially ship them right off up north to Fairley. Um, and I guess that's about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great, Seth, thank you. I think you actually sent me a picture of your harvester and I didn't put it in, so I apologize. That's <laughs> cool. I, is that just not it? Try and do it. If, yeah, maybe yeah. I can pull it up for at the end if, if you want and yeah. we can show it was a video, I think. So sorry about that. No, um, hey, that's fine, that is okay. Yeah. Any questions for Seth? Thanks, Seth. You make potatoes sound like way easier to grow than <laughs> I think I mean, yeah, you're they, just a it's, pro. <laughs> it's a tricky, I mean, they take up a lot of space for a long period of time, but with our equipment, we're set up to do it. So we just kind of keep doing it. But I'm seeing less people grow potatoes and I'm starting to get why, but I don't know, we like doing it. So, you know, what, whatever, we'll, we'll keep it up. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks. All right, sweet. So my name is Jake Kornfeld, um, talking about some squash and popcorn we've been growing for the farm upstream, which is a little side hustle project of some friends of mine. We've been doing this for the last two seasons, and uh, I also manage the farm at the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps in Richmond, and so we've been doing this there as well. So I've had four go rounds in two years of this little combo intercropping. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's nice to have an intercropping that actually seems to work pretty well. Um, I've tried a couple that have gone very poorly, so it's nice to have one successful. Um, we've been growing these crops 
primarily because we needed something that was low maintenance and we could move it in big batches without auto storage. So everything about the way we've been growing these has been sort of low infrastructure, low input. Um, and I think the result has been pretty good, but also definitely lower yield because uh, we've been growing without irrigation and without a lot of uh, tools that we'd like to have. So um, in terms of the, the strategy, seeding, we've been seeding uh, pretty early. So third or fourth week of April and two seeds per cell in a 50 cell flat, and then planting them out as doubles with slightly wider spacing. So we're doing 24 inches per spacing um, or per plug and the plants generally just grow in other directions and seem to have plenty of space with two feet to do pretty well. Um, and then as we are transplanting the same day, we're seeding uh, popcorn, a Dakota black heirloom popcorn with an earthway seeder. We're just running that down one side of the row. So um, bed prep has been, we've been able to get away with just disking and perfecta. So maybe two passes with a light disc and then run the perfecta through, I'd say probably twice. Um, on the VYCC plot, I ran the bed shaper this past year and definitely liked that better. Um, gave us more control for cultivation, but we did not have irrigation set up on this plot. So decided to stick with just planting straight on the surface of the soil with no raised bed to try to capture the groundwater. Um, we're growing on a munson Rainum silt loam, so it's a pretty heavy, silty soil. Uh, holds water really well, sometimes too well, uh, but let us do this without irrigation, which was great. Um, after we're planting, we are putting a new piece of row cover on, and that's been a pretty key part of it. Um, there's a lot of three-striped cucumber beetle pressure here, and we had used row cover on our VYCC squash this past season and new row cover on uh, the farm upstream squash in an adjacent field. And the results were night and day in terms of how fast those plants took off. Um, sealing the edges with soil. So I saw Nora's question, maybe it was um, in the chat and we just, took the time to do it with a shovel and I would echo what somebody else wrote that it really didn't take as long as we thought and then to remove it if you're just careful and use an open hand and move with intention and can generally get by without ripping it too bad so you can reuse it um, and then timing was everything for us so we made sure to plant with the rain and waited until the forecast looked good um, and waited till frost was passed so tried to plant as close to the last frost as we could without risking the crop entirely. Um, I guess the other thing that was important for seeding and planting was uh, marking the beds. So we had a G mark the beds with a basket weeder ahead of time so that we could be set up to cultivate mechanically. Um, let's see. So yeah, a couple of pictures along the way, the formatting got super wonky on this, but we started to see flowers and fruits super early this year. Um, like early June, we were seeing flowers and we pulled the row cover after four weeks. So that was basically the point when the popcorn starts to push up on the row cover. So we're starting to see delicata flowers forming up at that point, um, but not open yet. So we weren't feeling like we were risking pollination, but in the prior season, we actually saw some of the popcorn get a little bit stunted by the row cover. So if we leave it on too long, it the leaves will sort of get um, curled up and they don't seem to recover super well from that. So making sure to get the row cover off in time was, was key. Um, as soon as we pulled the row cover, we ran through with the G with some sweeps on it. Um, and then cultivated again a few weeks later with uh, an IJ cultivator just in the pathways at this point, just kind of pushed as close as we could to the, the row of popcorn without damaging that. Um, and then the same day that we ran the, the path cultivator through, um, we broadcast about 12 pounds an acre of medium red clover. So 
that was also timing dependent. We waited until just before some rain. Um, and I, I really liked the outcome of that, but I wish I had waited a couple weeks and done another pass just with a scuffle hoe to clean things up and scuffled in the clover. Um, I think we would have seen a better germination rate and we had some weeds come through that I don't think would have if we uh, just waited and did one more pass. Um, kind of see the clover starting to come up here. We harvested on August 8th. So it's a pretty early crop, which was the strategy for us because that's the only way we're getting into the market at this point. Um, just cut and pile and then leave a couple of drive rows, definitely sacrifice some efficiency and harvest because of the popcorn. We can't just drive down the beds, um, but the value seems worth it. We have been curing in a propagation house um, for about a week because that's what our buyers are asking for, but it seems unnecessary to me. Um, I'd love to move away from that. It seems like just an extra movement of the crop. And then just real quick on the popcorn harvest, um, we just did it by hand, shucked by hand, dried in mesh bags, undercover, um, borrowed some equipment from Cloudwater Farm, a cyclone electric corn sheller and a fanning mill. Um, and we've been selling that bulk and it is a nice little value add. It brings up our gross per acre and doesn't add labor at inconvenient times. So it's processing that can be done late in the fall and it is fairly pleasant work and you get to eat popcorn, which is amazing. Um, if we were gonna do this on a larger scale, we just did it on a half an acre. Um, I'd love to do more of it, but if we were gonna do popcorn on a larger scale, it would definitely be worth investing in a little bit of equipment to harvest and, and shuck the corn, especially. A um, Couple quick numbers, yeah, half acre, about 115 labor hours to do both crops. Um, Delicata yield 5,000 pounds for the half acre, which is okay, but not great. And the popcorn yield, I think, honestly, could probably be double that if we fertilize more heavily. So we fertilized with ProGrow, um, according to Becky's awesome amendment calculator. And I actually think we should maybe increase it by 50% or so, because it seems like having two heavy feeders right next to each other in that bed is just, by the time the popcorn is done for the squash is done fruiting, the popcorn just has no gas. Um, so some kind of a side dress or a heavier fertilizer up front. Um, and we grossed about $5,500 off that, which is totally outlet dependent, I think. So it could be a lot higher if we wanted to spend more time, but we generally took the, the easy option. So that's all I got. Thanks. That's awesome, Jake. Thank you. It's great to hear about your, your side gig. I, I, farmer full-time with a side job farming. It's great. It's like Seth has that one too. I think so. Um, uh, any questions for Jake before Rachel hops on for garlic? Rachel, um, go ahead. Tell us about garlic. Tell us things we don't know about garlic already. Okay, Thank I you. hope so. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Rachel Stevader and I work at UVM's Catamount Farm, which is the home base for the farmer training program, among other things. And um, I'm gonna be focusing on hard neck garlic because I stopped growing soft neck a bunch of years ago. Um, we can grow beautiful hard neck at Catamount and I find soft neck to be fussier. Uh, although I do miss making garlic braids. Um, so I'm gonna start us in the fall with planting. Um, and these are some specs that I always have to remind myself of on an annual basis. Um, just when we're setting aside our crop for for part of our crop for planting that fall. Um, and we don't fertilize when we plant. Um, so we often have some kind of a cover crop that we are turning under before um, getting beds ready for our October planting. And because our planting, is um, 
programmatic. It's one of the final tasks that our farmer training students complete um, as they're finishing up their season with us. Um, we're always planting that final week of October, but in general, you, you're going to want to go four to six weeks before um, the ground freezes and you're aiming for root growth and no top growth because uh, you can get damage on your top growth once temperatures drop. Um, so for us, as you can see, we're doing three rows per bed, but you're looking at three to four rows in a bit per bed, 12 to, to 15 inches apart between rows. We're planting at six inches apart within row and then um, pushing that clove down one to two inches in the soil. And we wait like another month before we mulch. Uh, so we're aiming for a frozen ground. I find that helps with critter damage, letting the ground freeze first instead of laying the mulch at the time of planting and doing it before the snow comes, um, which is always a little bit of a game. Uh, and we we started bailing our own straw. Um, I don't know, maybe it was the my second year on staff at Catamount. Um, we happen to have access to equipment because of the dairy farm down the street, UVM's dairy farm down the street. And we had a person on staff who um, wanted to do more bailing uh, with his time. And so we lucked out. We let some of our cover crop uh, grow out. And so often we're bailing rye straw in June that we um, round bale up and then set aside so that we have our own straw. And I find that doing that, bailing a, a June crop of rye straw is really clean. Um, that's before weeds come on strong. Um, so then, yeah, after mulching, just letting it be and um, not thinking about the garlic until the snow melts again. Uh, so that brings us to the spring. And because we don't fertilize at the time of planting, uh, we're raking off that mulch in the spring. So once snow is melted um, and the straw is no longer frozen, then we um, will rake off that mulch and that's when we'll amend. And we just amend once. So our soils are high in phosphorus. We're not adding compost on an annual basis. Um, so based on soil test recs, which we do soil tests every other year, um, we're amending for nitrogen, and then depending on what the soil test is telling us, um, sometimes we're adding uh, potassium as well. So we we go with Pro Booster for nitrogen and potassium sulfate for um, any potassium that we need. And we'll try to get one cultivation in before laying irrigation. Um, we're on really sandy soil, so. Uh, I love hearing about operations that are uh, growing without irrigation, and I'm still impressed that that um, folks can do that. Um, we definitely need to lay irrigation, so we're laying drip, but we try to get our first cultivation in. Um, we've got a cultivating tractor, uh, Alice Chalmers G, that we will incorporate those amendments, um, and then and then lay the drip sometime in April. Um, and usually it's like two to three, maybe two mechanical cultivations. Um, ideally we're not hand weeding more than once. We've gotten away some years with not needing to do any hand weeding at all, but it's usually one, at least one hand weeding somewhere in there in May usually. Um, maintenance, so our hardnecks, right? So we're gonna get scapes uh, from our hardnecks. So therefore we're clipping those off. It's usually a month prior to harvesting the crop. Um, so getting those scapes off, we give those out in our CSA. Um, so yeah, Catamount has, that's probably the, 
the bulk of the food that's grown on the farm moves through our CSA, um, as well as, yeah, we have farmer's market, farm stand, wholesale accounts, but we're giving out scapes to CSA members um, until we actually have garlic heads to give out. Um, so I guess this is one of the reasons I, not leek moths, but um, one of the reasons I enjoy growing garlic is that I, I feel like it's um, pretty pest and disease free for the most part, or at least relatively speaking. Um, I think that most folks growing in Vermont at this point um, are probably pretty familiar with leek moths. Um, what I find is that we definitely lose some scapes to leek moth damage, but we aim to, the, the crop is usually too tall to do any kind of physical covering. Um, so we lose some scapes, but I always feel like we're still swimming in beautiful scapes. So I don't sweat that too much. Um, and we try to harvest the crop before um, a second generation takes flight. Uh, so yeah, when we were not playing close enough attention, we definitely were getting more damage in the bulbs, but um, but that seems to be minimal. Um, I just slipped this in there as well, just a reminder that we're dealing with <clears throat> multiple generations within a season. Um, and then one other disease to, to note, um, and honestly, this basil rot, it's usually when we leave the plants in the ground too long. Uh, Catamount has, I said, really sandy soil. So we're lucky in that um, it's just really well drained. So I feel like more often than not, um, we're just, we're not sweating uh, anything, anything fungal and just using cultural controls uh, in our approach to, to handling um, anything that does come up. Um, so with harvest, we're looking at mid-July and uh, we're waiting till we get some of those bottom leaves starting to yellow and die back, um, but really not waiting too long or else the the head really starts to to rot um so yeah the plant is is still pretty green when we're when we're yanking them from the ground um and we probably do this over a two-week period and in part um it's because we wash our garlic before curing so this idea was introduced to me by a former co-worker um, I was a little skeptical at first washing before curing, but I have to say I'm sold. Um, we've been doing this for years now. Um, yeah, this idea was brought to us by Sarah, who's pictured there on the right in the orange bibs. Um, Sarah used to be, used to work with the, the diggers down, um, down at the Intervale. And yeah, it's probably a little bit longer for curing, but um, I, it seems to save a, a ton of time when it comes to, to the cleanup process after curing. So I'd say maybe, I mean, it depends on the weather, but um, probably about a week longer than normal for, for curing. So a month instead of two to three weeks. Um, and we cure on, on racks, but um, yeah, you can go either way, right? You can um, hang in bundles or uh, single layer on, on screens and you're just, yeah, wait until the neck is dry and the outer skin is papery. Um, and as I just mentioned, it's probably a little bit longer when, uh, when you're washing before curing. Um, and then, yeah, once the, the plants are, are cured, um, 
To start off, we're just storing at room temp in wax cardboard boxes. Um, but I think anything that has some air circulation, you know, mesh bags or any vented container can work for you. Um, and at some point, late winter, anything that we still have, like still that we still have in storage, we'll place in the walk-in. Um, because I find that, yeah, the, they, our heads will start to sprout otherwise. Um, and then, yeah, TV bit on pricing. So um, seed garlic, as I'm sure most of you know, is spendy. Um, so we're setting aside some of our crop every year uh, to plant our own crop. And that's kind of why I didn't talk too much about varieties, because at this point, at some point in there, this was like a ger so a German variety, and I do wonder how long how long do you have to keep growing, uh, saving and growing your crop that until you can call it by your your farm's name. Um, so I generally call this Catamount Farm garlic. Uh, and then in terms of direct market sales, um, latest prices I saw were fifteen to eighteen dollars a pound, and that's what I got. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, um, I bet Seth is wondering how he could get 10 happy looking people down to pick potatoes. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I know it's not easy running a farmer training program, but um, it's a lot of people. I know it, it probably looks luxurious to some. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, some days it is. Am I still sharing? I want to X out of this. Yeah, or maybe you are I'm not. Uh... Um, so there was one question for you. Someone said, um, do you really have to remove mulch? I find my garlic grows right through. Yeah, no, I bet. I think a lot of people do that. Um, and no, you don't. And if it's working well for you, I think you should keep going with that. Um, we remove it, as I said, because of our amending in the spring. And also we don't lay drip in the, um, in the fall either. Uh, so if you're not doing those things, I think you should keep doing with what you're doing. Great. Any other questions for any of the speakers before we sign off? And I know we have Scott and Vic here who are like work a lot with um, some of the pests that came up today too. So um, you can chime in. I had a but question for Seth. Just real quick, Seth, I was curious. Um, I wasn't sure if I missed this, but your timing on what, so you said you planted a, a trap crop, a couple successions, and then um, when do you actually plant your crop that you're hoping to harvest? It's usually around the 20th, 20th of May, so something like that. Um, mm -hmm. We kind of go by the dandelions. When the dandelions pop up, we'll usually put the potatoes in. Um, yeah. To try to miss that beetle, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that it? Nice. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Cool. It's really great to hear from some like newer voices too. So thank you all for jumping in and um, sharing so much great information. Very appreciated and. Um, Super psyched to a quick a quick clarification that um April 20th, that's when you're starting to plant, or May 20th, excuse me, that's when you're starting to plant the potatoes uh, for trap crop or the ones that you're planting to harvest. For the trap crop. No. Okay. Or and then sorry. waiting the other way around. We'll we'll plant the trap crop early in May. Even if the conditions aren't right, it's a little early, we'll still try it out. They they'll they'll grow. Um, in our experience. And then around the 20th is the, the main Got it. Thanks. Sure. So just to clarify, you're, you're planting a trap crop like first week of May and then aiming for your main cash crop 20th? Yes. Okay. So like three weeks. Yeah, Andy. Yeah. I, just to follow up, Seth, are you putting, like, what's the layout of your trap crop? Is that a perimeter or or in between where last year's potatoes were and your potatoes will be or what's that how does that work yeah that's a that's a good question it's um it's usually in between the two crops uh for so 
we'll plant next to where we planted the previous year. And then, the yeah, the trap crop. Uh, and then the crop that we're going for that season, ideally is across the brook. So we'll plant pretty much trap crops adjacent to the previous year. There's one more question in the chat, maybe for the, some of the brassica nerds. A um, couple of years ago in a row, I had many heads of cabbage with a bad leaf halfway in the head when you cut it open. Anybody know what that is? Is that calcium? Probably. So yeah, calcium tip burn, some combination type of thing like that. And probably related to like water and heat stress and less about nutrients. So never a fun surprise that's for sure looks great on the outside slimy on the inside anything else thank you guys so much um i'll post the recording and reach out if you have any further questions so thank you all so much thank you thanks becky it was great to hear everybody thank you. bye yeah thanks becky and everybody yeah, thank you guys